Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture online at polarinertia.com, and by PressUp, friendly web consultants who listen to your goals and provide solutions that make sense. Online at pressupinc.com. So wh- where exactly are we? All right, so this place is called The Central, and it's by Honest Eds that you might know from Scott Pilgrim Comics. That I can only assume you must have seen Honest Eds, right? The huge sign. I knew of Honest Eds. Actually, I was reading about it. All I knew about Toronto for a while was Honest Eds. Like, there was this vast, eccentric place with the guy with the sort of corny jokes and the really cheap household items that immigrants go in and buy. Them are poor people. Uh, you know, whomever. It could, be, it could be poor whites, too. <laughs> uh, Canada has those. And... I knew about this place, and I was thinking, man, isn't Honest Ed's going to like go away soon? Coming on the flight, I was like, am I going to see Honest Ed's? Will I find it? And it was the first thing I saw when I came out of the subway, like, bam, a giant facade of Honest Ed's, and the jokes are right there, and I remember the lights. Yeah, and I got to assume, I don't know, I don't know what its fate is now, but like, I, I went in... End of the year, that's all we got. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you better stock up on toilet paper or whatever. Because, yeah, I went in there one time when it was still, like, a, con- a going concern, but it's like, <laughs> I think it started before dollar stores and stuff, right. so it made sense to go through this labyrinth to try to just get a, oh, good deal on a pot, but it is so complicated and so weird, and this sign is like like a texas belt buckle of a sign just like all lit up i heard the city like subsidizes the power bill for wow. it because it's like national a, treasure exactly so i mean yeah municipal that's, treasure in any case i'm just glad i got to see a bit of it before yeah. it's because like that's insane how could that even last but anyway so we're central, near there central's around the corner from there and this is a place where i used to do this podcast with my friends where we would just sit around at a bar and talk and drink and it was not extremely popular but it was really just because uh, when you're a grown-up, like, you can't hang out with your friends. They're always busy, and, oh, i got to do this, and I can't, whatever. Right. So it was literally just an excuse to hang out. It's right. like, like, we have to. We have to hang out. We have to do the podcast. That's a main function of podcasting. Like, it's, we can get into this a little more uh, as after I introduce this show. Yeah, I'll do that. You know, but it's, 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 no, it's no rush. Uh, we don't have to stand on ceremony for this one. Um, but podcast, podcast. You know we're in a junkyard right now? Yeah, sure. we are. Yeah. Even, even though we are surrounded by broken chairs, even maybe the one I'm sitting on. But podcasting is oftentimes, you, as you say, for podcasters, it is a system to still hang out with your buds. And even sadder for podcast listeners, it's uh, like, I don't have conversations with my buds anymore. I can listen through my earbuds, as it were, to these dudes, and they'll replace, like, having friends in life. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's the weird thing, too, is, like, podcasting has become so ubiquitous, but so, like, un- like just so spread out that... that- it used to be virtual friends for me, and now it's my actual friends. Like, my friend yeah. Joel does a podcast with one of his old friends in Calgary. <laughs> he went to Cuba, and I just never got to really hear the stories because he got home with his kids, and he was all frazzled, yeah. and I just, we didn't have time. Mm-hmm. So I listened to his podcast where he told his old friend from Calgary all his Cuba stories, and I was like, oh, there we go. Probably yeah. 20 people ever downloaded that podcast, but it was like... They, they loved it. Yeah, I got to hear Joel's Cuba stories. Like, it was awesome. Right, and this is yet another podcast you're listening to, Notebook on Cities and Culture, Toronto edition where we are sitting, yes, in this bar, kind of in a... It looks like it was formerly a patio, but it's now shut off, and we found our way back into it, and it's just a part of Toronto I never would have seen otherwise. I'm sitting here talking with Keith McNally, whom I will call a podcast auteur. He's known for... I mean, if you know him through podcasts, you know one of three shows, maybe all three. There is The Vinyl Countdown, which he mentioned, which is, it was, it just ended. It had a long run, 250-ish episodes thereabouts, something like that. Something yeah, like that. Three guys getting drunk, and as, yeah, like, totally, hanging out, getting drunk on a podcast uh, for 250-ish episodes. There's I Have a Ham Radio, which is a music podcast. You share a playlist, but you have your commentary. You record often on the streets of Toronto or wherever you happen to be. But then there's the show that I found your work through, EXO, which I discovered years ago and found it to be one of the most, like, minutely crafted, like, most painstakingly crafted and personal podcasts that I had heard. Uh, I found, uh, specifically, I think I tapped into an episode where you were drunk and recording it. The basis was your drunk self-recording, talking about how happy you were not to be in New York anymore where you lived before. Not to be in Vancouver anymore, where you lived before, but to be back in your hometown of Toronto. When was that, and why were you so happy? Man, well, 
I guess it was, well, actually, let me just jump back for a sec of um, how we found this place <laughs> or whatever, because I was going to say, like, the trick to recording in public, like, I love recording in public. Almost all of my shows are like that. Mine too. And it's, it's trying maybe to... Because of your subconscious influence. And I'm, I doubt it, but maybe. But I was even thinking, like, can you hear that buzz now? Mm-hmm. Where, what, like, what is that? Where did that come from? But this is the life that we live, right? Is always trying to find places that are quiet. Right. We don't and, live in studios. <laughs> right. And that's why we found this bar, is because we were trying to find a bar that was quiet. And we're like, for whatever reason, if you go upstairs in the central and go to the back room, there's usually not people there. Mm-hmm. And then the back, back room, this used to be like the set of patio. I haven't been here in a while. Now it's just garbage it right. just is just like they're old broken stools and tables and stuff but just since i knew about it like i was like don't worry we can go back here and like oh. like <laughs> this floor could be rotten we could fall through and this podcast could be like the last the, our last testament effectively like the last haunting thing people have from us that would be amazing yes uh, uh no wait sorry what was your question again about yes. uh, t- how long ago this drunken yes. podcast on xo you made in tribute to toronto when you had right. returned because you'd lived here earlier you went off you know you went over to new york you went to uh vancouver you've been around and then you returned to toronto and were drunkenly happy to be in toronto why right so i guess i guess the easiest way to, to is just talk about new york is like what my problems were with new york and why'd you go to new york so what really how i really started you're canadian you, you had you had to like find a way to get to new york and i always like i liked the idea of america but just through like writing like mm-hmm. i used to love ayn rand books when i was an angry little teenager and you know for whatever sharp buildings they're yeah. not sharp enough here and sharp political opinions yes. and whatnot yes. and like despite all the craziness of her and her wacky just intolerance she really did have this way of painting a picture of like right. this heroic image of man and new york was the place right. for that and every like three thousand sentences there'd be one that was like that's pretty insightful no matter what you think of of uh what's her objectivism right. like yeah that's pretty real that you know you but that's not a great ratio ultimately no and you i was like you got to make like excuses like well <laughs> english isn't her first language and she is clearly crazy and yeah. you know you add all these things up but then yeah like you said sometimes it's really great yeah. or even to be more uh like there's this comic book called preacher that uh, oh, yeah. i think it's becoming a tv show now but it's uh, an irish guy who wrote that i think it's not coincidence you got a russian lady and an irish guy and they, they their view of america was like yeah america like to the point where i was like i can't believe i wasn't born in america right how did i get born in stupid canada what a rip yeah like, this is lame this is not where i deserve to be right. or belong what would, what did canada lack in your mind like that america seemed to have what was it dr- either drained away from canada or never there in the first place i think it's it's and i think this is still probably true except i just appreciate it more now is that we're just not driven we're just not like yeah i'm driven. not saying yes as in you're not driven but that's an important quality in places right and uh, i mean that's absolutely new york like the girl i dated when I, whose name was i and how weird is that but uh her, her dad. common name, by the way. <laughs> Not at all. Her dad was a big fan. Oh, okay. But, uh, okay. uh, but she described like her own life. She worked at a uh, law firm in Midtown Manhattan, and she's like, you get up and you're like a hamster all day. You go in your little subway trail and you go to work and then you go to lunch and then you go to the gym and then you go to da 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 and like that's it. And you just run in on the hamster wheel through the little hamster cage, but. But she didn't necessarily say that like it was a bad thing. It's more right. like, hey, I did it. I yeah. can survive in the hamster cage. I can make it here. Right. Right. It's <laughs> like in Los Angeles, where I live, there's, I would say, an equal amount of ambition, but there's no rules structuring it. So it's sort of like people are really ambitious in strange ways you can't quite parse. And they all, they're, have you been over to Los Angeles? No, I never have. It's, it's, so picture, <laughs> picture. Yes, the drive of New York without any rules or expectations of guiding it, and you get that sense. But what's the situation with the ambition here in Toronto? Because it's where people come in Canada. Like, you want to make something of yourself? You're not going to do it in Saskatoon. Yeah, I guess it's all relative, right? Because I was back in my little hometown last month, uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick, that's like 60,000 people. And that's one of the main things I missed, was it didn't seem like anyone there had any ambition or drive to do anything. And it's like, I do miss that in Toronto, like at least people seem to care about their lives or right. <laughs> like want to achieve something right. but compared to new york yes. it seems like everyone here is just so lazy and <laughs> laid back <laughs> and whatever and just like yeah. like we have to have one big city and we have to have some bank buildings so this is where they are it's kind right. of <laughs> yeah i guess if we have to have a big city toronto is going to be it guys but that reminds me when you're talking about la um 
one thing that I guess surprised me about New York, because my only view of big cities was like the Welcome to the Jungle video oh, or whatever. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, that's what I thought everything was like. Yeah. And coming from a sort of rural place, like everyone reinforced that. I never really thought about how, like, my grandmother mm. lived in Montreal by herself till she was like 97. Mm. Like, and if she could make it, how bad are these cities that right. I'm so worried about? But I just, I just took everyone's word for it. For sure. But then I moved to Vancouver in like 2005 and it's beautiful. Like, you know, you've been there, you, it's yeah. like, it's amazing. And I was like, this is a city? Like, this is great. Like, this looks more like a model of a city. Yeah, it's uh, unbelievable. Like, there's the really bad parts, yeah. but overall, I couldn't believe how nice it was. I just felt like people had just been lying to me about cities. Right. So then, how the New York thing happened is back in the early days of podcasting, again, like having podcasts be your pseudo friends, <laughs> I was a projectionist and I was up in this projection booth all day and just like, it was cool to be able to do that because that's not a thing anymore. Everything's digital. So I got in right at the end. Could uh, you still thread a projector if you, you had to do it right now? It would take me a couple tries maybe. It's pretty complicated, but I think I could do it. But yeah, it was cool. It was like if you had to change one of the ads that goes before the movie, right. like we had to go in and snip it out and it's like Civil War surgery. Yes, like what am I yes. even doing oh. here? It's so crazy. If, was switching the reels while the movie played actually hard or is there just an automated thing for that? Yeah, we didn't have to do that anymore because that was when yeah, you had to flip from reel to reel where, right. why, where how it was by the end was you just... Uh, like connected them all together on a huge platter which man Lord of the Rings movies oh my god like they didn't design the theater with yeah. those movies in mind so like we there were times we, I couldn't fit it down the hallway and then you have to tilt the whole movie sideways and try not to drop it on the floor nice. but I was up there and just really lonely and bored and that was like the first real year of podcasting and every podcast was terrible <laughs> just frankly they're really That's boring a new really form bad. you know but then there was this one podcast, Keith and the Girl, that is kind of like, uh, you know, Howard Stern, sort of Opie and Anthony type of vibe. And, and man, that one stood out like crazy because it was, they were basically, I think, the first, like, jocks, for lack of a better word, to do a podcast. Like, they were talent and not tech. Like, they right. somehow learned how to do a podcast, but were not that type of person. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so great. And I started writing them little funny letters, and they had a stand-up contest that I won, and I got to know them a bit. So that's how I ended up moving to New York, is I started doing video work for them. Mm. And they were like, hey man, you know, you seem to be drifting in life like I, well, I am still now and was then. Yeah, nothing going on, come on. Yeah, and I was talking about like, hey, I've been in Vancouver a while, I don't know if I really want to stay. So they were like, well, you know, we got someone who needs a roommate, if you want to move to New York, we can help you out. Mm. So for a year and a half, I lived like down the street from them. Mm. And, and, and honestly, it kind of tickles me that you don't know me from that. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't heard Keith and the Girl, or I haven't heard it substantially. Right. I'm aware of it. I know that it's one of these things, like in podcasting, all internet things, but in podcasting as well, there can be some enormous, like just gigantic entity by podcasting standards, and you can somehow be into podcasting and totally ignorant of it. The same as like a... I've heard a few episodes of what's one with a huge following like oh uh, yeah dude you know I, I know of it I know there's a giant devoted following but I've never met an oh uh, yeah dude guy to my knowledge and that's the thing too like that's a good example like I've had a few people tell me about that show so I've, I've probably listened to five six episodes and I'm just like I just don't get it and I'm sure it's too girl. late you had to get in early yeah you'd feel the same way about keeping the girl and uh and it was a weird thing, too, where just the way podcasting grew, where they were enormous back then, like they were number one on Podcast Alley and all this, mm -hmm. whatever. But then... Probably dominated Podbean, too. Oh, probably. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, Podcast Pickle, that was a thing. And, and just, yeah, top of them all <laughs> yes. for that brief, beautiful moment. But yes. but then every celebrity in the world started a podcast and whatever, and, and now, like, Keith and the Girl's doing fine, and they still are going along, but... but I used to say that and people, it, again, like you were saying, like even if you never heard it, you knew what it was, people don't even know what it is anymore. Like that's how much things have changed. So, but, but unfortunately that's what most people still kind of know me for online because I had a real bad falling out with them because it was so aggressive. Uh, like the whole thing was like... Just tonally of a show? Like the just vibe was aggressive? Yeah, well it was like, well I'll have fun and hang out, but then once the 
the recording is on like that's the time now that throw down the gloves and we'll say exactly what we want to say to each other because that's what makes the show so entertaining right and and i mean i was as guilty as anybody i've ran some people through the mud like so hard on that show and then when it was finally my turn i was like well Yep, I guess it had it's to like, happen. It's like blood sport. I mean, when you get the Hong Kong guys waving their money at you from the sidelines, you just do stuff you wouldn't do otherwise. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, and I think even, I don't know, I mean, to get, I don't know, this is kind of getting off the rails a bit, but I was thinking about it lately that I think I kind of needed, like, a mentor, like, because my dad is just some guy in my life who I never really hung out with. Sure. And then suddenly there's this guy from New York who's just, like, so vibrant, and he's got, like, these strong opinions. And I, as I was saying with the Ayn Rand, I think I just used to like that. <laughs> that black sure. and white rigid view of stuff seemed like a strong way to be. You kind of wanted a leader to follow. Yeah, and I did. And I'm like, let's follow, la, la, yeah. la. But, yeah, ultimately, it just, uh, you know, you can't live like that. It's crazy. You can, but... When you got to New York, I mean, what was the plan? Were they just were they essentially saying, "Come out light, come on a tourist visa, live in this room, leave when it, leave when you absolutely have to"? But it was like, what was the what was the seeming situation here? I guess it was. Yeah, I mean, it was. Well, I'd never tried to get visas or anything, and I ended up getting like a visitor visa, but not a work visa. Right. And uh, I guess I can get into that later. That's kind of led to how things are for me now. But uh, I, I guess when I got there, I was just like. I'm just going to try to stay. I don't know how, but it's like, this is the place I'm supposed to be. I'm in America now. Let's try to stay. Mm -hmm. But it really was a severe shift from the Vancouver thing, where sure. where Vancouver is like, this is a city? This is like a Lego city. Like, right. how is this even real? Whereas New York was a city. What city. part of New York were you living in? I lived in Flushing. It was way at the end of sure. the 7 train. But, I mean, you know, you spend all day in Manhattan, mostly. And uh, the girl I dated was in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that's not a great place. <laughs> it's, it's a popular place. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it's getting now. It's, well, it was in 2008, so it was... Like the trickle down of uh, Williamsburg, yeah. the Greenpoint, or whatever. And, sure. But it was still like if you went three blocks the wrong way, you're like, whoa, I'm like in a Spike Lee movie right now. Like, I'm just not supposed to be here. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it was crazy feeling. Yeah. I'm sure it was fine, but I mean, I'm a little white dude from Canada. I was like <laughs> scared. <laughs> but, but New York, I guess, I was surprised that it was, it was more like what I expected a city to be like. But I had already been like inoculated by Vancouver. Like I feel like if I went straight to New York, I'd be like, "Well, this is how it is. It's loud. It's dirty. It's filthy. It's horrible. Whatever." I remember something evocative about. I think it was that same podcast, the two and a half hour one, where you're excoriating New York and like praising Toronto. And the thing I remembered the most since I heard it was you were just, you got to like this, the peak of the rage in the podcast. <laughs> And you were like, it's like something just doesn't work in New York. There's, whenever there's an open receptacle like space, it just fills with garbage. <laughs> like the way that spaces fill with garbage. I mean, do you remember saying that? Whoa, we have a raccoon weird. visiting us. He's on the fire escape. This is a true urban experience. I was wondering what that noise was, right? Because I heard it sounded like somebody was going through a garbage can, but I was like, who? We're on the second floor. He's just looking at us. Yeah, no, he can't no, do anything. Is that the guy that owns the place? Because like I was saying, the third floor is, I think, his bedroom. Yeah, Maybe the raccoons own it. That's actually kind of a nice image, right? The raccoon yes. and the, the starry sky. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm getting a really good view of Toronto. But, like, do you remember that part of the rant? Not in particular, yes. but, I mean, that was kind of the feeling I had all around. Like, well, just the other day I heard someone talk. It's this guy, Colin Moriarty, that works for IGN, and he was talking about going to um, Japan to do video game mm -hmm. stuff. And he was talking about what he liked about Japan that he wished America would adopt like sort of like that sense that you just little things like you don't litter like right. you just have this this sort of honor bound society to keep yeah. everything you know uh, in order right. and I kind of feel like Canada is at least much more like that than America like we just right. don't I mean I should say we I, we do I mean I have all kinds of friends that just litter right. but it but they're like the jerks you know <laughs> like, I know I know it's with my thing with Japan is always and I recorded some episodes in Japan a few years ago and talked about this on like half the interviews but the way they can have vending machines outside that have good stuff in them like drinks that are actually good uh, and they're everywhere no matter where you are like suburban urban no matter what, and everybody I met from North America or even Europe there would be like, yeah, if those we had those back home, 
some guy would just sma- like junkies would smash it in the night like everybody assumed they'd be destroyed just because they were outside even like a Vancouver guy said this to me it's like yeah junkies would strip it for saleable metal overnight <laughs> why do we think why do we think that like things set out in our countries will get destroyed even Toronto must have a measure of that sense well even it's a lesser example but when a bunch of the New Yorkers were in Toronto that was one thing that came up is that at the hot dog stands and stuff all of the condiments are on the outside and they're just there for people to take whereas in New York they're like you you know they're right. hidden away and one of the New York people was like how how come no one gets drunk and just just tosses all the the mustard and ketchup and it's like well cuz why would you do that <laughs> you know? yeah I like this idea that you'd just be so filled with the need to toss something over that you would just t- overturn the ketchup when you were drunk and, but I mean then that like cartoonish idea of New York is not really true I mean like New Yorkers really were like really friendly and like if you get lost somewhere like they'll help you like it's not as bad as all that it's just I think it is just what you get used to and like after spending all this time in Canada and I just I just had a base level of expectation for how how loud things were going to be and how dirty they were going to be and and I just couldn't like survive <laughs> when it wasn't like that. I also learned just in the last like couple of years I found out about this thing called misophonia that's like this uh sound sensitivity where people it's like there's something wrong in their brains where subject of an XO in fact. It is, yeah, that's right. Where sounds like they just react really really uh, they get upset about noises and I wasn't even totally sure that I had it for real until I was home last month and my parents dogs would start barking at weird times of night and it was like a knife in my head like I just could not take it where obviously my parents can and I think New York was a similar thing but I didn't realize at the time like I think that's what made me so frustrated is I would go outside and have like a timer ticking down over my head to when I'm just gonna lose my temper because I can't I cannot be in a good mood when it's so loud and crowded and I just thought everyone else felt that same way and that made me so like mad because I'm like how come you're putting up with this and I think what I realized eventually is like they just don't feel like that like the noise doesn't bother them and there's not that much noise here uh, I mean not as <laughs> not comparatively like the not girl the sort of jackhammers and whatnot that girl I dated I mean she lived by the JMZ train and just would leave like right by it it went right by her window and she left her door her window open <laughs> yeah so I mean obviously I don't know why I didn't realize it at the time but I suddenly realized like in the last year or so like wait a minute other people aren't like me and, right, yes. <laughs> and maybe so I feel like I was unfair to New York like it's not the place for me at all right. And and it's not even so awful. I mean, there's, you know, the parks and stuff. And and there's, uh, I don't know, there are parks that are nice. Midtown Manhattan, for instance, like, is nice. Like, it doesn't have garbage everywhere because all you got to do is give a shit and <laughs> clean it up. But just most people don't. They just don't care. And it's, yeah, there's, there's a slight Japanification of New York that you get you get Toronto out of that equation if you take some of the neatness of Japan 20% of it I don't know and put it onto New York you get some kind of version of Toronto right yeah yeah I'd say that yeah like I don't know if you've been to like the financial district <laughs> it's like everything here is like cartoonishly ridiculously small compared to New York but but it's where all the bank buildings are and I mean it's it's little it would be 20 times bigger in New York but but it's just nice and it's right. just so just I don't know man I think I'm just a big wuss. I just want things to be nice. <laughs> right. That, I mean, there's you can frame it that way, but you can also frame it in terms of, you know, people from your hometown in Canada that have never left, right? That are still there in New Brunswick, maybe still in Fredericton. Just sort of, what are they doing? Man, uh, there was actually and why when I was home. There's this lady uh, who, and I think she's in her late 30s, and she lives uh, in an, uh, an apartment that my parents own. And I was blabbing to her, and she told me she had never left Fredericton. And I thought this is telling that she called it Fredericton. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, never leaving makes it harder to pronounce the place. Where you're at. <laughs> Fredericton. I mean, do you have like? I don't know, a Facebook feed that's full of Fredericton people who never left, or is that... Are they, have you just cut off yourself from that crowd? Yeah, like, there's not a ton. Like, is like when I went home, it was actually kind of heartwarming in a way, because my original plan was I was going to go home for a month, and then, just because I'd been in Toronto so long, let's just shake it up, I was like, 
maybe I'll go back to Vancouver. Maybe I'll go to, I thought St. John's, Newfoundland would be neat because I've never been there. And like, that's the closest to like a weird adventure I could do without leaving the country. But it wore me down so much being back home. And I was like, I don't even know anyone here anymore. And everyone is just like, it feels like a, a movie set that's not even being used right now. Like that's how empty everything yeah, feels. Town kind of. Yeah. Well, like our our big Starbucks type thing is called the second cup right. and there's only one second cup in my hometown and I was there on a Saturday afternoon and it was only a third full where in Toronto that would be impossible like you're fighting for space so it really just made everything feel fake and weird uh, I see. so I really hollowed out yeah yeah and it's like it'd be nice if you're you know old <laughs> it's nice for my parents and even that like if I w if I was old I would almost want to be even in a city even more than I do because things are closer. I don't want to be old and like driving 18 miles to get to the gas station, you know? Yeah, actually that's a good point because like I think I think yeah, I will. Let alone the hospital. Like uh, my grandmother who didn't leave Montreal, excuse me, until she was in her late 90s and then she moved to, you know, rural Quebec somewhere. Sure. And where you, where you go when you're 97 or whatever. <laughs> and she didn't like it at all. She's like, oh, why did I think this was a good idea? Like, And sadly, because she's just kind of stubborn, she just lived out the rest of her life, this place that she didn't really like. But How long was that? 103 or 4? Yeah. But all my grandfathers died in their 60s, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so which leaves you to balance out somewhere in the middle. I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so what I realized... I, I didn't even have the energy to go to on a new big adventure to go to the east coast or the west coast from my hometown. Like I was like, I need to go back to Toronto where all my friends are and where I feel better about myself and recharge here. Like this is my home base now, which was a weird feeling. Like it's not my hometown anymore. Mm -hmm. Now your your podcasting, as I say, runs the gamut of production from like, I need to bust this out, do a playlist and my voice for ham radio, or a bunch of guys getting drunk and talking, vinyl countdown to you know like the sort of maximum intensity how long does it take you to do an episode of XO I mean there's no average but like what do you put into these things yeah it really is basically it's like it couldn't it goes from it couldn't be less meticulous and unlistenable like some of those vinyl countdowns when we were in a bar they're just like hard to even listen to like they're just <laughs> loud and awful and the XO is it is like 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 making a watch it's like clock right. tinker work it's just like crazy yeah. elaborate and that's why i thought the description was fairly apt that you may still use but first used anyway when i saw it on itunes like a show in the style of this american life the production is really this american life like maybe even more meticulous in some ways but it pissed off to no end a lot of the itunes reviewers <laughs> like this isn't like this american life one star i mean Clearly, there was a divide in expectations there. Yeah, I don't know if that was the best. I just I use that because it's what people know. But actually, this American life is kind of lazy. They really just uh, take some, you know, here's some generic jazz music, and here's a story about, hey, do you know if you peel off five layers of wallpaper, you can see the wallpaper that they had in World War Two. <laughs> like, yeah, you can. <laughs> and you use a variety of tracks. They do have the same stable because of copyright or what have you, but you throw it all in. Right. Well, actually, because the, the real thing that actually inspired me more is even more meticulous than my podcast. It was called uh, A Life Well Wasted. And yeah. this guy, Robert Ashley, he did an episode a year and a half ago. He still does them sometimes, but... Too he, meticulous to make on any frequent schedule. Yeah, his was crazy because it was, again, like, you know, stories. His were video game based but he'd go interview people but then when he integrated the music it was music him and his friend made mm -hmm. so it was like a step beyond anything I could ever yeah. dream of doing that was like crazy and he he used to because I remember I emailed with him a little bit and he gave me some tips and stuff and I think like the number he gave me was like it took him like 30 hours to do like a one hour show like it was crazy so yeah. for me it's definitely not that much I'd say it probably takes me like 10 mm. So what I usually do is I just take whatever my little story is and mostly just put in music that I like, songs that I like. And in a way, it's almost like it's really kind of closer to just making a playlist of songs and like subliminally almost like just <laughs> including a story in, between, in these songs. So not a world apart from ham radio. Like ham radio is the almost... It's not simplified, but like more off the cuff version of XO. I think, in a way, yeah, I think that's part of uh, like 
where some of the idea came from. Because ham radio, I would just... It was because I had a, one of those old DV cams that used uh, those mini DV tapes. And I realized if I just talked into it, it actually has a really good microphone. Yeah. So I started just walking around, talking <laughs> into my camera. And, yeah, just talk about whatever I was doing that day. And then it was kind of kind of boring, but some people liked it. And then and here's a song that I like, and maybe a little bit about why I liked it. But there'd be that little overlap where I would, when I was editing later, put in the song just like they do on the radio or whatever but just like here's the start of the song and then it starts when i'm done talking and those were always the coolest part right so it's yes. like well why don't i just make the whole thing <laughs> feel like that like yeah it's it's an interesting mean interesting method of production especially because in xo you seem to correct me if i'm wrong each episode is based on like something that you have been fixating on recently whether it's i mean the elliot smith album xo giving the show its title or I, some of the ones I remember, I, there's of course the drunken one about how happy you were to be back in Toronto, but there was one, there's more than one on a road trip with your mom, if I recall correctly, you're like, what is the significance of that road trip to you? That was, man, I remember one time I recorded, before I started XO, I did a ham radio with my mom where I um, recorded just me and her talking about songs that she liked, and something went wrong with my microphone, and I lost the whole thing. Yeah. And I just was like, I think because I want to be closer to my parents and I'm just not, like it's a really, we're a really just, uh, what's the word even, of just, we just, you know, don't spend a lot of time together. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I think it's because Nothing she, against them, but <laughs> nothing for them really in particular. And, and she had like 12 brothers and sisters growing up. So I think she like super rebelled against that. So now she's like crazy private or whatever. So it was amazing to me to have this recording and then to lose it. It's like, oh man. So, so then. We got to take two on that. <laughs> so that was, I think, it was even like it was the second episode of XO. Like that was one of the first things I thought was like, all right, I got this, this new podcast I'm doing. Now is an excuse to talk to my mom. And she told me about the first TV they got and how apparently radio even back when it started was not on all day they didn't have enough programming in canada to... right, just went off. <laughs> yeah, i was like that's insane yes. uh, actually i had an idea i don't know if it's realistic but my mom loves to travel and my dad doesn't and i've never been overseas and i'm like i don't know how i'm ever gonna so i was thinking i should try to talk my mom into because my parents are lawyers they have all kinds of money i should try to talk her into taking me on a vacation and then I could buy like a GoPro, and yes. you know how everyone uses those for like sports videos because they have the fisheye lens and everything. And I thought it'd be so funny to do a, a travel show of me and my mom, but we're just like sitting at a cafe <laughs> in <laughs> Italy or something, having a long, boring conversation about what the Beatles were like with a GoPro. <laughs> that would be excellent. <laughs> it's so funny. But the last time I was home, like I don't know, we just didn't get along that well. And I'm like, is this realistic? Can I really do this? I don't know. Even better in a way. I mean, I watch <laughs> like. I've been studying Korean for the past seven years or so, and I have a, the second satellite dish at home so I can get the Korean channels. And I watch it with my girlfriend, who was born in Korea, so she's a native speaker and understands better than I do. But I've, I, I practice by watching, practice listening. Not an easy, not an easily listened to language, Korean. But they have this program where they just throw two people together who have like a bad relationship, like an estranged dad and the son, or coworkers who don't get along, or you know, like the mom and son who are sort of resentful toward each other, and send them traveling. Like they just make them go someplace and like really, really focus in on the cracks that appear in their already bad relationship. So maybe this is a, an avenue to go down. That's actually not a bad idea. And uh, I heard about it's more extreme, but I heard about a Japanese show where they get uh, that would be more extreme. They get little kids who are like really little, like you know, four or five years old, to like, hey, go two blocks down the street to the store to buy milk. <laughs> and the whole thing is like, you know, everyone on the route is part of the show, and everything's totally safe. But these wow. kids are just freaking out and crying and oh so upset. God. But you know, it builds character and yes. whatever. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm gonna awesome. some episodes of Ash. I don't remember what it was called. Oh, but yeah, that's nuts. Some other ones, that, uh, some other episodes of XO that I remember pretty distinctly would include, like, you'll find, often it seems you'll find things on YouTube that fascinate you and then make an audio podcast out of YouTube, out of the audio from YouTube videos. Like, you've talked about doing another one of those recently. Uh, about some like weightlifter who has yeah. motivational oh, <laughs> words, but then the there was uh, there was one I remember on the speaking of Japan, the vlogger Roger Swan who was uh, in Japan a few years. Like, how do you find these figures who like fascinate you on YouTube and make what makes you want to do an XO about them? Well, yeah, it's always the most random nonsensical ways i guess it's it's a good uh reason not to get too hung up on things being like trying to be 
or trying to avoid being lowbrow because <laughs> being lowbrow can lead you to a lot of great stuff. Uh, like for instance, Roger Swan, it's this heartbreaking story of this guy who, he was one of the early vloggers who went to Japan to teach English and he would put up an episode every week about what he was doing. And then, uh, he got pancreatitis, pancreatitis and died. Yeah, it's like one of these just totally freakish things. That then you can't stop thinking about, like, am I going to get this thing? Like, there's n clearly there were no signs. I heard, uh, too, I mean, I don't know if it, it was a factor with him, but I heard that um, eating, like, raw fish and stuff, especially if you're not used to it, can help, or can, like, add to the potential for that. And he would happen to be, at the time, he was uh, teaching English in, like, some rural place. Right. And not in a big city and it just seemed awful like he just had a really bad stomach ache and he just was like I'll just tough it out and he died <laughs> and it's yes. like he, but then so the way I found him it couldn't be more lowbrow it's right. this girl Miss oh god I, re I remember the story now <laughs> oh please do tell it though don't don't, don't spare anybody this <laughs> it's Miss Hannah Minx who she's not really active anymore but she used to do Jap like lessons of like here's a Japanese phrase and and mysteriously, these dumb phrase lessons would get a million views, right. but it's because she had huge cleavage. Yeah, she's not Japanese, by the way. No, not at all. Yeah. And I was just watching her stuff and <laughs> just to learn some Japanese, no other ulterior motive there. And, <laughs> and she had um, Roger Swan's final video was right. her like her channel intro video. Right. But I didn't know anything about him or that he had died and I was like, what is this? This is weird, but I watched it and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like I didn't even know people. Like, not what I came for, but okay. Yeah, like I didn't know people did. Right. Uh, that's the great thing about how schizophrenic the internet is. I'm yeah. looking at boobs one second and the next yes. second I'm like, oh, this is interesting. It's like a guy right. talking about teaching English in, uh, did you hear that? About, that was a totally yeah. Canadian one. Um, well, not every second can be boobs ultimately <laughs> on the internet. So what fills the other seconds? That's going to be something interesting. Yeah, and this, so I was like, oh, this is neat. This guy has been vlogging about his life in Japan. How cool. I'm going to go check out his channel. And I watched some more videos, and I started noticing these these really eerie comments of, like, we miss you, Roger. Yeah. R.I.P. Roger. And I was like, what? There's an iceberg here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I, then I realized that he died, and I went back and watched everything. Like It was like, I don't know, 200 videos. And, and I just clipped out little moments from it and then made a podcast out of it. Like, here's the story of him talking about... I'm going to go to Japan to teach English and, and making new friends and kind of growing into this like more self-assured person by going on this weird, cool adventure and then dying. But then there were all these responses. That was the other part that was cool right. is people from all around the world. Cause he was, you know, his videos got a few thousand views or whatever, like, you know, not huge or anything. But there's a community and they make response videos. Yeah, and these really heartfelt, like, this guy was a big part of my life for years and I never got to tell him and I never met him, but I felt like I knew him. And it just was, like, the most heartbreaking thing in the world. That's the episode more than any of them that people email me and are like, man, I had to... I listened to that at work, and I had to go into the bathroom and cry. Thanks yes. a lot, you jerk. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like the saddest thing ever, especially because Roger Swan, if you go to his video, seems to be, like, one of these extremely wholesome guys. Like, you know, there's... It's one of these things, like, if you're atheistically inclined, you're like, yeah, there's definitely not a god. Because, like... I would have gone first according to the grand scale of morality versus this guy. Like, he would have been the last to die. Yeah, he was fantastically nice. And, oh, you know what's a weird thing, too? Just how small a world it really is, is one of the XOs I did was about uh, a girl's divorce. She just sort of told me the story of her divorce. And I found out later that she's from Battle Creek, Michigan, that Roger Swan was from, and oh. knew some of his brothers. Oh it's like, God. how crazy is that? That is so nuts. But I that, know a guy from Battle Creek. I should pursue this connection when I return to Los Angeles, but continue. Is his name Rob Van Dam? <laughs> no, I'm afraid it's not the same guy. <laughs> He's a wrestler from Battle Creek. But. I hear the, sm the city smells like cereal. Yeah, that's what I heard too. <laughs> that's actually something that's like something I've been, it's been uh, like I just wish I could be more motivated where because the Roger Swan thing came from YouTube videos and it's about 90 minutes long, I was always thinking like I could just reinstate the video to that mm -hmm. and it could be a documentary about right. this guy. And I've got it about half done. Oh, we started on it. Yeah, but it's just, it's so much work and I don't know what to do with it because it's also these 2008 era YouTube videos. They look terrible. <laughs> right. They're just really low res and really awful. But I don't know, hopefully someday it's I'll actually... It's a period piece at this point. I mean, that's, that's how videos looked and we liked it. Right, yeah, maybe I could make it cool somehow. But that's yeah. the other thing is, like, I don't want to... I guess, like, XO is a good example. Like, it, it is, it's the one, like, good show that I do that is, like, you know, legitimately worth listening to. 
but it did kind of plateau at some point. I think, you know, it was two or 3,000 downloads or something, and that's really as far as it ever got. So now I just do it for myself. Like, there's no yeah. hope that it'll become a big thing or whatever. Right. And so that'd be similar. Like, I wouldn't want to just do this documentary about Roger Swan and just put it out online and maybe some people watch it or maybe they don't. Like, I feel like I'm at this point now where I'm going to put this much work into something. Yeah. I want to make it a huge deal. I want this to be like like you know tied in with uh i don't know some kind of charity or something and yeah. like get someone to promote it or push it and it's like, i want someone to care exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah, what, what are some other things that obsessed you you made an xo about that surprised you by others by it resonating with others you know you mentioned the people crying in the bathroom after the roger swan episode what are some ones that you made and you thought man eh, I put a lot of work into this, it probably obsesses only me, and then people actually responded. I think the one that I get the most um, about, other than Roger Swan, is there's this, the Photopia episode, did you ever hear yeah, that that's Yeah, now you bring that up, that was actually one of the reasons I looked into your work in the first place, because, I mean, for some backstory for the listener, I have a ham radio is a phrase from The Simpsons, I mean, it's a, a beloved joke from The Simpsons, essentially it's about the seeming uselessness of a technology in its initial or declining stages so I wanted to when Google, I don't know, some Google Wave or Google Buzz or one of these things that isn't around anymore came up I just wanted to post to it with a photo of with a screen capture of the Simpsons episode with uh, Patty or Selma's ham radio saying I have a ham radio along the bottom that's the joke, it's just, that's what they're saying on the ham radio is in some unknown language <laughs> every technology a Google Wave is just like I have a Google Wave, when you start at a Google Buzz, whatever, I, a ham radio, I have a ham radio, you know, that's what it's down to at this point. Although I hear that ham radio guys say the most, like, uncensored, off-the-dial shit on, on ham radio. Someone's working on something about that. I'm, I'm looking forward to this project. But uh, I Googled that to find the image and found your stuff, I think, and I saw it was KeithCourage.com as your website, and that was a TurboGrafx-16 game I had a few copies of, still do. I mean, that was a console I was always very interested in. That was the packing game, like a rebranded Japanese game um, that they, it was cheaply packinable for I them. Like, I like that you say you have a couple, because I also had two copies of that game, because yeah. it was the packing. Everyone had two for <laughs> some reason. They pile up. They buy, <laughs> you, you buy like ten games off eBay, and Keith Courage is three of them. That's, that's how things go. But in video game collecting, certainly. Right. Uh, but then I saw that you did an episode on Adam Kadri's Photopia. Adam, Ka this is like it's the obscurest combination of things now because Adam Kadri is a guy who I encountered at the Northwest Book Fest in Seattle, or I saw him speak there in like 1998. Because at that point he was a 25-year-old author with a novel out, and I was a little not a little kid but a kid at that point and I was like hey cool that guy's pretty young and he wrote a novel I'll see what he his thing is found out he wrote what's called interactive fiction which I was also mad into like text adventures like infocom computer games from the 80s where it was all text you would type in what to do it would tell you in text what happened like that was the first kind of computer game there almost was because it was all text but then it had become its own thing later on in the 90s so you knew writing interactive fiction was like a hobbyist computer game making area I got into playing those games found out he was like a renowned creator of those and so when I saw like he still does a website he writes up things he thinks about movies and novels and whatnot and I've followed it pretty religiously since those days it's one of my longest followed websites so I find this combination of factors on your site you did a whole XO on this game Photopia that Adam Kadri made what why did you do an XO on Photopia? I was going to say, I guess, yeah, at that point, you got to check out that guy's work when you have that many things. I know, right? It's, <laughs> it's like, so weird. What, so what is this? Well, the internet gives you these stars alignment moments, doesn't it? But why, why Photopia for an XO? So with that, it was when I was a kid, I had, you know, this, the computer with the just DOS and the monochrome green screen and you know couldn't That's what you play text adventures on yeah it couldn't play a lot of actual games so we played a lot of text adventures and they were always impossible and just like weird puzzles I don't even like puzzles in games like it just drives me nuts but but we played them because we had nothing else to do mm -hmm. and then it was mostly my friend Brad never really let them go he he kept up with them and every time one of those sounds stops I'm like that sucks that that sound was there the whole time <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so he kept up with with 
text adventures after they stopped being commercially viable mm -hmm. and the internet 1983 started. I would have thought <laughs> something yeah. like that yeah and once the internet started there was a news group rec.arts.infiction because they changed the name to interactive fiction to make it sound more fancy and they every year had these competitions and contests actually in November I agreed to introduce uh, oh no now I forget his name Andrew Plotkin is yes, going to be here. He's also a very famous interactive fiction author. I think some, a guy, or there are some ladies in the field who are into that, who are into those kind of things, would know the name Adam Kadri or Adam Plotkin pretty well. They're like celebrities in that field, though Adam Kadri doesn't make a lot of stuff. Yeah, so now I've got to figure out a way to introduce this because it's at the reference library at Blur and Young, and sure. there's always just a bunch of people hanging out that are just there for whatever's happening. Mm -hmm. So the dude who runs. Regulars. <laughs> the guy who set this thing up, he also found XO, I think, because of the Photopia episode, and he's like, hey, would you like to try to introduce him and try to set the scene for people? And I'm like, oh, this is what a nightmare. Like, I gotta make people care about text adventures, but I'll, yes. I'll do my best. It's go time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Brad always kept up with all this stuff, and they would have a competition each year. Mm -hmm. And I think the first, so I would, you'd tell me about games, and I'd play them once in a while. But then Adam Cadre did this one called Interstate Zero, I-Zero, and it was so cool because it was not rigid, like yeah. most games are just puzzles. You're stuck in a room, you have a key and a fish, and now what do you do? Kill this gnome or whatever. Right. Where this one was just, it was like, it was way more open. It was like, mm -hmm. just whatever, what really surprised me about it is you played as a girl who was hitchhiking on Interstate Zero, and and you could take off all your clothes. That's what the game's known for. Yeah, and then the game would be all like pervy and stuff and say all, and I was like, oh, this game's kind of lowbrow, but yeah. then I learned it actually pulled a 180 on me because yeah. when women play iZero, they of course don't take off their clothes and then there's yeah. nothing sexual reference ever. It's just, it's like, oh, you want to be like that? Okay, then I'll be like that too. Like, right. <laughs> I was yeah, like, oh. it's, it's almost not, it's a game, but it's not a game in a way, and that's what characterizes Adam Kadri's most of his interactive, interactive fiction, is it's really worthy of the name because it's not an adventure and it's not a game. Photopia is especially not a game, right? Yeah, I feel like he was hugely ahead of the curve. Like, now there's stuff like, uh, oh, what's that game? Um, Kentucky Route Zero and uh, Gone Home and all these, like, narrative-type games that are really just, you get from the start to the end and you can't really affect... It's not, you know, some people say it's not a game, but Photopia was like that back in 1999, where it was this story of it's basically just the story of a girl and she dies and everyone's really sad but you play you kind of jump through different periods in your life and you always play not as her but as someone in her life right. that adored her in some way or another and because of the interactive nature of it like you are that person and you're going through and it's a lot of it's just choose from these four options what you want to say in the dialogue like you couldn't really get stuck but it would guide you to do what you needed to do. Yeah, or like there was a, a part where there's like a kid, or she's drowning in a pool, and the babysitter has to go get her out. But if you don't in time, like someone else does, like there's right. no fail state or whatever. Yeah, and and it was just like incredibly moving. It was just being like that that thing that it feels like only a game can do is right. like you're inhabiting these people that are part of her life and you're taking these actions even if your hand is kind of forced you're still mm -hmm. pressing the buttons and typing the keys and making it happen and it just like you just feel so bad you're like how is this person <laughs> dead oh yeah, my god right. even though it's just a fake person but i thought that was like the trick to it was that you're involved directly and it wouldn't work otherwise but it is so linear that i was yeah. like i wonder if i could just kind of narrate the story yeah and what if i could just make it into like a little radio play and i remember i emailed adam cadre and asked him and he's like you know actually i already sold the radio rights to somebody but they never did anything with it so <laughs> i won't tell them if you don't tell them <laughs> how about it <laughs> yeah so i made this i don't know if you ever heard it but uh so i just like recorded myself kind of telling the story that happens in this game and adding sound and music and stuff and people all the time tell me just the other day, this girl told me, she's like, you know, I know you didn't write it and stuff, and it's not your thing, but that is my favorite XO. <laughs> like, well, I mean, how, what am I going to, I'm not going to argue, it's one of the most amazing things ever, like, Photopia is incredible. It is, and it's funny because your XO has traction, but as, as Adam Kadri told you, he sold the radio rights to someone who didn't, he, they didn't do anything. Uh, I would he I would see on his website as I say I followed it references to him writing a Photopia script or like someone commissioning him to 
screenplay eyes, Photopia, and I mean, we haven't seen a Photopia movie yet, so there's clearly something about this work that, as you say, is so suited to interactive fiction that it's basically going to work there, and I would imagine that people who hear your XO, they like it, and then they probably all find the game sooner or later. They, like, look for it, I would think, right? I hope so. Well, this girl, like, I told her, I was like, I know you don't... Sorry, to spoil that point, but... <laughs> like, I know you don't play games and stuff, I said to this this girl, but, but you know, you should really play it, like, just to understand, like, because there's, like, a part in the game where it's it's this, the girl's name is Allie in Photopia. She's telling a story to a kid she's babysitting, mm -hmm. but you play those parts like an old yeah, school text cool. adventure. And there's all these like things that, just details that you would miss out on if you just hear me tell the story. But I was surprised that it still worked so well. And like this girl never did and never will, right. <laughs> you know, go play the game, <laughs> which is kind of a shame, but, but I don't know, like, I, cause I kind of fantasize too about making a movie about it. Like, wouldn't that be cool? Like, I think it could work. But it's never going to be quite yeah, the same. It would be a movie where I would envision that every of this, every one of the game segments, because you, each time you play as a different character, would have to be a different style of filmmaking. Like each one was its own, clearly identifiable movie. You know what I mean? It's so weird too with Adam Cadre, where he, you know, he kind of discounts Vitopia a little. He's like, hey, whatever. I wrote it in like two weeks or something, and yeah. you know, I did all these other things that I think are way better. And it's one of those weird cases where it's like, yeah, but they're not way better, though. Like, that really is the one. <laughs> that is the... He has the most traction. I mean, I think about how I got inter introduced to his work. Uh, it was a novel uh, called Ready, Ready okay. okay. Yeah, did you read that? I did. It was weird, man. I always wanted to read it again, but yeah, at the I, time... Yeah, same thing. I, I, I'm like, I should read that again, but I read it in 2000, and, like, I haven't actually gone back to it, but continue. Do you remember, just like, the, I, a lot of it's a kind of a blur to me, but I remember there was, like, this character in the book that's like this girl who always dates the wrong guy and right. she's always like things aren't going this is a spoiler for ready okay and and she's always uh like dating the wrong people and stuff and then there's this moment where um she's like extra sad one night and she hugs the main character and says something to him and it's muffled and he never quite gets what it is mm -hmm. and then she kills herself and it's like one of these virgin suicide things like oh man everyone's dead and i don't understand why ah right and to me like that's where like photopia works so much better where in photopia i was just like devastated that this person is dead where in ready okay i'm like i don't even understand why that happened what is going on but what's interesting is that as you say, Photopia was ahead of the curve, and then also he was ahead of the curve with Ready OK, because that was a school shooting book, essentially. I think, and he'd written the bulk of it, let me get this right, I think the book did come out pre-Columbine, don't quote me on it, but from what I've read, the, the pre-Columbine school shooting that was high profile, like somewhere in Arkansas, that happened, and then he finished up the book really quickly because like now this is really topical so he in a way had the first like work of art on school shootings but then the publisher mishandled it in a way like the one editor took it on then went away on maternity leave and another one like dumped the book essentially like hey we're not going to do a paperback you know that kind of thing but in any case you can tell ready okay is a very personal book in the way that photopia is a very personal work i mean in the way that xo is like a super personal podcast are you attracted to yeah xo is probably a pretty personal album by elliot smith's uh, standards of always being pretty personal are you attracted to these works in general that are like just super meaningful to the creator and kind of let the chips fall where they may about the audience yeah, I think that's definitely something that it always, it, it like, attracts me. Like, even you were saying that guy, Elliot Hulse, that I've just recently yeah. discovered, the uh, the bodybuilder, he described it so well, where he does these things, like, he'll say, like, hey, if you're depressed, here's what you do. Like, his whole thing is that, <laughs> like, the mind-body connection is, like, right. ignored by a lot of people, and, like, if you just exercise, you'll feel better. Like, stop trying to fight your head with your head. Just, like, right. you know, just to get out of your problems, like, go exercise. And he had this uh, this one really like bizarre video kind of where he's like, hey, if you're feeling depressed, do this. And it's just all these weird motions with his body. And he looks like a Muppet and he's flicking all around and making like these like hoo, hoo, noises and doing all this stuff. And uh, and he got kind of a lot of like blowback in a way of just like, are you crazy? Like, why are you putting this online? You look like a crazy person. And he's like, what can I say? Like, I'm, I'm eccentric. There's and, a fine line okay. between the personal and the crazy, isn't there? Like what seems crazy or what is just super super within one person right yeah and i think it is I just yeah like that that notion of just not not um masking who you are for right. like 
the world, you know, so you'll be accepted. Like, I think that I've always liked that. Like, even before Ayn Rand, I was huge into Frank Miller. I loved Frank Miller. And he has gone off the deep end. I don't know if you've read any of his comics lately. He's, but it, but you can see it coming the whole time because he's like, here's what I think, here's how I want things to be. And then Ayn Rand, and then the Keith and the Girl guy. Like, I, just these, I like these people that just, they just, or even like Adam Cadre. I mean, I thought Ready OK was a weird book, but like you said, clearly, here's the book I'm going to do. This is my book. Boom. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, there are these uncompromising, I guess this is what people mean when they call the work uncompromising, like this is really true to whatever the creator wanted it to be, and what's fascinating to do with works like that is you do it in XO, and I do it myself, I'm working on a series of video essays about Los Angeles movies, taking them apart and re-editing them into 10 minute video essays, and it's, what is the appeal of just like separating those works into pieces and then making them into your own thing, like do you get? I feel like I get a better understanding of movies doing that. But what do you get in the sort of rearrangement of your favorite works? Well, I was going to say just uh, to put it back on you for a sec. Weren't you doing a thing for a while where you were going to try to watch like every experimental film? That was well, oh, I was going through the Uber web. But yeah, it's I was, I was doing that, and then I had to like move, and then I moved and didn't resume a lot of the projects that I was doing before. You know, like it's an unrelated thing. You move, but I feel like you've talked about moving as a reset button in life like you might as well just reset a few things while you move right well i think that's a good example though of just like like the the uh like experimental movie reviews is like i don't i don't understand why why you would do that but but no who else is gonna do that is the point like that's why it's so great is because that's you're the only one who's gonna do that and yeah, now, I should, I, now I wonder, like, I, I forgot too late that I, I was like, oh, wait, that thing I was doing, like, it, the, the move swept a bunch of things under the rug, essentially, and I was like, wait a minute, that, oh, and then it was a year later. So I was like, no, this is awkward, what do I do? I just, I like that, I guess, no matter what it is, like, even if it's like, because to me, that's a weird project that you're embarking on, but just anything that no one else could or would do, like, those, I think, are just the most valuable things, right. especially now, man, we were just so awash with the internet, like... Do you ever miss just going to Blockbuster and it's like seven movies for seven days and you have to wow. pick seven movies and then you got to watch them? It's the appeal of limitations, I suppose. You know, the, the internet has made us realize we like to have limitations sometimes. And I do notice there's a few video stores in Toronto still. Like, there's a few yeah. Queen videos around, right? There's, there's one right next to here, yeah. yeah. Like, it's, it's... Do you still go... That said, do you go to these stores? Do you go to the remaining video stores to seek those limitations? Not ever. I mean, I did buy a, a VHS copy of Josie and the Pussycats the other day at a Value Village <laughs> at I, store. I hear that's an underrated film. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But that was because I was going to start a podcast with my friend. I don't know if we're gonna, but where we just watch uh, 90s-ish teen movies, so, you know, we'll slip into the 80s and the 2000s some, and then just, but again, it's just an excuse for us to hang out and watch a movie, and then we'll review it, but but we figured to make it more fun, like, we have to find the movie in the wild. Yeah. <laughs> Cause Do you have to watch on VHS? If we got it on VHS, sure. And, uh, and just because... Even though, like, the level of quality of everything has raised a lot with the internet, like, those seven movies for seven days of Blockbuster were probably seven pieces of crap, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, like, now that everything is just, it's so, I don't know if demoralizing is the right word, but I just kind of don't care about stuff as much anymore. Right, well, it's, there's a lot of stuff that you're asked to care about, but this is, it's representative, the way that I found your podcasts, the way that I find anything in life now, it's like, it's not about necessarily where you are, or what you're looking for in general or what you're into it's about where the most circles of the venn diagram meet like you're looking for the parts of the world where adam Kadri meets keith courage <laughs> meets ham radio you know like it's at a certain point it's just about you have to filter by the number of points of contact you have with something right and weird coincidences might be involved or interests of yours that don't necessarily connect to one another might be involved but with the internet, with podcasting, with these other forms of media, with everything being accessible, it's like we have to find a way where we have to find a way to to drastically narrow things down. And if it's just unlikely overlaps, that's probably where we're going to live in some sense in the future or indeed the present, right? One thing that's a good thing too about that, now that I think about it, is um, it kind of doesn't matter like like not having a huge audience, right. like 
Well, you can't have it. I mean, unless you're some kind of asshole. I mean, you, you could be, you could be Nickelback, but come on. And even and even they're niche now. Yeah, and you know that's the Canadian secret is that their first album before this is how you remind me the one before that was like good. Oh, really? <laughs> I swear to God, but let's not get into that. Yeah. Um, because like yeah, it used to get me down a little sometimes. I think also coming from Keith and the Girl that had you know fifty, sixty, whatever thousand listeners, right. and I was like, oh man, I'm never gonna have that with my own stuff. But I realized it really doesn't matter because when I was back home visiting, I was talking to my what friends I still have back home, and we were talking about our favorite YouTube video game shows. And like I, sure. I watch the Game Grumps, and this other guy watches Rooster Teeth, and the other guy right. watches another thing. And the thing is, we had never really heard of each other's shows that we like, but each Even one. Even in that s just incredibly specific form, medium, and genre. And each one of those shows gets millions of views. Like wow. they're hugely popular. But but we didn't. We were still like, oh really? Let me well let me show you the one I watch because right. like how is that? So if you can get a million views and still no one knows what you are even though they're looking for that and they're interested in it like like who cares it doesn't even matter like if a million is a drop in the bucket and you're still invisible then just just who cares don't even worry about it was there some point of the keith and the girl days where the scales fell from your eyes in terms of like popular things shall we say like this thing is a mega hit by podcast standards was there some point you realized you didn't want to do what clearly has to be done to be a mega hit uh i don't know cuz I mean, I guess I never really wanted, like, what they had per se. I guess what I learned from them really is that, is that it's always going to be work, no matter what. Like, they have this podcast that pays the bills and it's their job, which is way better than a, just having a normal job. But they still have to get up every day and go into their studio. I was doing a documentary about them that I never finished because we had our falling out, but. It's so that much been work. a good element of the documentary, by the way, the falling out itself. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but uh, if only I, yeah, could have held it together a little more, and it just could have that could have been really neat. But uh, but yeah, like the the hours they put into it are bananas. Like they, it's a full time job still. It's just just a different job. Right. And I guess I guess that's what I learned from them is like there is no shortcut. Like it doesn't. You might as well do what you really want to do because even if. Even if you could somehow magically have any of these golden jobs, there's still jobs. I'm sure Steven Spielberg still just works his fingers to the bone. Like, there's no, no one's got it easy. The more the job aligns with your interests, the more 24 hours it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. With the years you've racked up again in Toronto, since that drunken celebratory podcast, with all the stuff you've worked on, with the, the time you've put in doing your thing here, do you still have the same enthusiasm for Toronto? I mean, it's hard to say. Like, Toronto really is, it's such a weird city where I said to you earlier, like, I love the Marge Simpson quote when they went to Toronto, and she's like, it's so bland and unassuming, and I just feel so at home. I'm home. <laughs> yeah. And it is like, because I've been here about four years, so I really was just on the brink of, like, I really should get out of here. I should go back to Vancouver, go to Newfoundland, do something weird. But... But now that I, I left for a month and I came back, and I'm like, oh, I really do like it here, though. Like, I feel like Toronto is just right in the middle. Like, a, mm. what are those things, like the level with the little, with the bubble? That yeah, you just to make sure a surface is straight. Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's just, it's not like a very exciting place necessarily. Like, there really was way more of that sense of energy in New York and just hustle and bustle. And it's not like ludicrously gorgeous like the seawall in Vancouver or something and it's not even like weird like Montreal where it's just like all like half French and stuff it I don't know it kind of doesn't have much in a way to recommend it really but but yeah but it's also like, that but is the most interesting part of Toronto to me yeah well it's just like yeah I, I never feel bad about being here <laughs> I mean right. I guess that's about the best you can say about something right especially in terms of a city because most cities make you feel bad once in a while yeah even Vancouver which is to me I mean I have this like magical view of Vancouver because it's the first place I moved and I just like it's my coming of age city or whatever but the downtown east side is a nightmare I've never seen even the worst parts of like Brooklyn weren't even close to that bad sort of like a hasting corridor of junkies and scarred hookers yeah it's like whenever there's a uh, 
Canadian cop show and they just need uh, here's an establishing shot of a place where someone got murdered that's always yeah. it yeah. <laughs> that's always what they use but they don't do anything to you the, the junkies and scarred hookers like you're not getting panhandled every few moments like in America yeah that's true I mean it is weirdly like comfortable still right. it's a weird thing they just sit around but yeah. that's actually maybe that's a good way to describe Toronto is there were some times in New York if it was late at night and I was in a weird neighborhood where I felt kind of scared or like the weird thing with New York that I didn't expect is when there's people around that's when you're fine it's when there's no people around that it's scary and weird but I like literally never feel like that in Toronto like I I can just walk around the town in the middle of the night and I sort of feel like I'm still in my house Mm. (laughs) I feel like I didn't even leave yeah You're at your home? <laughs> yeah. And people always talk about I've never been, but I guess Jane and Finch is the famously bad part of Toronto. And I just, I don't know, that's why I've never been. There we go, solved. <laughs> is Finch, is that the street where the subway ends? I was there today, like the last station you go no, to when you go. Uh, no, it's, uh, I don't think you can really, maybe it is actually, when you go north, you mean. Yeah, I was going to what they call the Asian Mall today, and I had to go to the end of the subway in, like, the far northeast. The Finch Station was where I was, and then I had to catch a bus from there. Is that the part of town? Maybe it is, then. I guess I'm not even totally sure. There's this old uh, Canadian rap group called the Dream Warriors, and they would always talk about Jane and Finch. And, like, there was yeah, alongside like, of the tracks. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I wonder if I should go sometime just to say I've been there. But I'm sure, again, I don't know, compared to New York, it's probably nothing. It's probably fine. Like, that's where I wonder, like, what I... Or I wonder both ways. Like, if I had gone straight to New York and I didn't know any better, <laughs> I would have thought, okay, well, this is what cities are like. Right. Where I wonder if I would have thought that same thing about Toronto. Like, maybe if I had come straight to Toronto, it would have seemed worse. But after a year and a half in New York, yeah, it's I, like candy land. It's like... Everything is contrast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So. Right. Here from... It's from uh, Toronto slash Candyland, by the way. We, we've been speaking today on Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been talking to podcast auteur Keith McNally, who's the uh, who's the man behind shows like The Vinyl Countdown, which is over now, but you can still hear all 250, 250-ish drunken episodes. Uh, I Have a Ham Radio, which continues, and EXO, which I'm, you're, we're sure to hear from that bodybuilder soon, right? Yeah, I'm still like compiling stuff. Oh, that's actually, I guess, that's one of the more recent ones that I've gotten a lot of uh, comments about is I spent like a year and a half just listening to Patrice O'Neill, the comedian, yeah. and just compiling his stuff. And that one, because I started putting the episodes on YouTube because I noticed people do that with podcasts. And it's so evident with that where if it's a random episode about me, no views at all, nothing, no one cares. Yeah. But if it's someone that someone's searching for, suddenly it gets thousands of views. And that one got tons of comments of people like, oh, man, that made me feel so bad. I miss Patrice so much. But no follow through. No one ever listens to a different episode. No, yeah, there, <laughs> no, there's no word for what they aren't doing, but they aren't doing it. Patrice O'Neill, Elliot Smith. Roger Swan, the girl from Photopia. I think it was... What's going on with the early death thing? I think it was uh, you, actually, that I learned the term memento mori yes, from. Yes, <laughs> because so that's I think, what you want. Yeah, when you reviewed, uh, for Maximum Fun, you reviewed XO way back in the day. And yeah. uh, and you mentioned that term, and I looked it up, and I was like, that's, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Yes. Like, if I just do shows about people that died and you feel bad about it but then you care about your own life for a little bit and it's a nice feeling it's true well thank you for the mementos morai keith mcnally and for uh, taking the time today thank you this has been notebook on cities and culture coming to you from the sort of junkyard behind the bar here in toronto i've been colin marshall you can keep up with the cultural creators internationalists and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org thanks Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, Jean Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andrzej Kudlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Blosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, 
Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, Nick Weigelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.